All right, so let's discuss some amazing research that both Ryan and Rob have, have came across related to Volt Typhoon of a, a compromise of 30% of the Cisco RV320, 325 devices. So this is some really interesting breaking research that uh, is unique to Security Scorecard as I understand it. So let's jump right into it. My name is Rob Ames. I'm a staff threat researcher at Security Scorecard. Uh, so that means I'm on the threat intelligence and threat research team here. Um, you know, my job is mainly to look at our data to try to determine new um, new insights into malicious activity, uh, and then of course also to complement our existing data with um, further collections. All right, so Rob, what exactly did the threat research team find related to Volt Typhoon? So I would say that the big thing that we found is that uh, its recent activity may have been uh, or may be and continue to be uh, more extensive than was previously reported. Um, uh, I believe that uh, our research is the first to sort of put a number to the amount of uh, targeted devices, uh, having previously known the targeted models. Um, ours is the first to put a number, uh, even a rough one, uh, to, for example, the possible extent of the compromise of just one of the many models of device that they've been known to target. This being the uh, you know the aforementioned thirty percent of Cisco routers, or specifically the two end of life models of Cisco router you just mentioned. So why are the Cisco RV320 and 325 devices a prime target for Volt Typhoon? So uh, they are, there are two reasons for that. There's one from the sort of technical slash device side and then one from the user side. On the technical side, uh, they're end of life devices. Uh, in short, they're old. Um, so old in fact that Cisco has stopped issuing updates for them, uh, which means that as new vulnerabilities are discovered in these devices, they aren't getting corrected. So that means that those vulnerabilities, which go uncorrected, can therefore be exploited by threat actors, which um, Volt Typhoon appears to be doing. Uh, then from the user side, uh, the other thing to remember is that these are small office home office devices. Um, that's most of the um, Volt Typhoon infrastructure we've seen uh, in our own research and in previous reporting. Uh, and then, you know, so SOHO devices, uh, as they're known, uh, as the name suggests, are, you know, for small businesses or even individual consumers, uh, which is a population that tends to, you know, not be as mature or well-researched when it comes to security or, you know, most things, uh, which allows for malicious activity to go um, undetected further, uh, especially when we consider that, Volt Typhoon isn't compromising these devices uh, to specifically attack the people that like own or use them. It's more, at least not in most cases, it's more to route malicious traffic through them onto a final destination, which is a you know bigger and kind of, um, to be a bit crude, more important target organization. So, you know, for example, like, I mean, it's not exactly the same thing from a technical standpoint, but just from a personal experience standpoint, it's probably roughly similar. Um, if I, as a regular person, have um, malicious activity going through the router I get from my cable company to, use, to have home internet, um, there's probably not going to be much, one, I'm, I might not even have much reason to notice, but two, I, I don't have the means. It's not like I'm looking at my own network logs or anything, you know? Um, and obviously... Uh, you know, the Cisco RV320, 325 isn't exactly the same thing as, you know, just a straight home Wi-Fi router, but its user base is probably more akin to a home Wi-Fi user, Wi-Fi router's user base than, um, you know, a more mature, larger company that might actually have a security team, might even have the capability to monitor their network or, you know, after an incident, conduct some kind of forensic analysis of what was going on on their network. Like, um, so... There's, you know, it, it's harder to notice and, you know, um, the people using them are less likely to, to have the you know, means or even motive to notice because, again, it's not, it's not targeting them directly. And honestly, and if it, unless it did target them directly, they probably wouldn't see anything going wrong. So 
let's actually take one step back. Can you explain who or what Volt Typhoon is, this threat actor group? Absolutely. So Volt Typhoon is uh, a name for a threat actor group that is uh, widely understood in the cybersecurity community to conduct espionage uh, on behalf of the People's Republic of China. So it is uh, one of the newest, but far from the only uh, cyber threat actor groups believed to uh, act in China's interest. Um, and as with most nation state cyber activity, the primary motivation uh, appears to be espionage at the moment, you know, information intelligence gathering. Um, that being said, the sort of big concern surrounding Volt Typhoon, which kind of um, pops up in most of the reporting that's come up around the group is the fear that um, it might, in addition to having information gathering capabilities, uh, represent an effort um, to develop more disruptive capabilities down the line. So the fear is, ba so basically for background, um, the initial reporting on Volt Typhoon, which came out in May, 2023, um, first from Microsoft and then a few other uh, organizations in the industry, and then shortly thereafter amplified by uh, the U.S. government and its partners in uh, CISA uh, warning, uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure uh, Security Agency warning. Um, a lot of the group's activity to that point had been targeting critical infrastructure, but especially communications infrastructure um, in both the U.S. and the Asia-Pacific region. And the fear was that having been able to conduct what was a very, you know, a pretty extensive, but also quite undetected um, campaign of intrusions, uh, having established a foothold in these communications networks, uh, the group might be able in the future, not just to gather information from those networks, but to shut them down or at least uh, suspend communications from them, which, um, if there were a sort of hotter, bigger geopolitical conflict involved, could be quite damaging. Um, that at least was the big fear. So that's that's kind of the background, big picture significance of Volt Typhoon. So the fear is that, okay, if they're in critical infrastructure and communications infrastructure between the US and a geostrategically important other region, APAC, uh, it might not be that they're just spying on that infrastructure, but at some point they might be able to disrupt it. And fortunately, those disruptions haven't yet occurred. Um, and we don't know if the capabilities are there yet, but there's the worry. And so that, that background worry, I think, shaped the sort of big picture understanding of why a full typhoon was important. Like maybe even in a digital sense, a sleeper cell of sorts, which can be turned on or activated in the event of a geopolitical uh, conflict. Um, they're just sitting and, and, and resting uh, silently and undetected within various networks to be potentially activated in the event they choose to use them. That's very interesting and and, and certainly concerning. Um, so let's let's move on to the next question though. With approximately thirty percent of the observed Cisco devices being compromised in the, just over a month, what does that tell us about the scale and effectiveness of Volt Typhoon's operations? Uh, I I think it tells us that. They are, um, yeah, they're they're quite effective and relatively widespread. Um, granted, in the in the grand scheme of things, the um, the raw number of observed devices still isn't huge. It was, uh, you know, a little over three hundred out of a little over a thousand. Um, so, you know, in the grand scheme of the internet, uh, that's that's not a huge number, but still, it's a bigger number than we'd previously seen in the reporting and. As long as it's distributed to the right location, strategic locations, uh, it could still have a, you know, a considerable impact. So I want to actually jump back to something else you said earlier as well. You s used a term end of life. So what is end of life exactly? How does the end of life status of a Cisco device or any device, let's to, let, to be fair, like how does that complicate defense strategies against such state-sponsored attacks as Volt Typhoon? Well, I mean, yeah, it does. It does can complicate them a great deal because end of life means that a device is so old and so many 
newer models or um, newer versions of equivalent products have come out from the same company that the, same, that the company that produces the device no longer supports it. Um, it basically, they stop issuing software updates, that kind of thing. Um, you know, the, the sort of business implicate, implication from the company side being you know, sort of, hey, please, please buy the new, newer model, right? But um, uh, the sort of maintenance side is that n- new updates aren't coming out. And one of the main things that software updates do when they do come out is they correct security flaws. So when you stop updating a device, you stop fixing its security flaws, which means those security flaws remain targetable for an attacker. And so, you know, I, I believe that these devices went out went out of life in like 2019 or so. So um, it's been quite a while. There's a fair amount of vulnerabilities known to affect them. And they're still in use, so they're presumably still targetable, and that seems to be what Volt Typhoon has done. So what is the significance of uncovering the new web shell, FY.sh? I want to call that fish. I'm sure that's not how you, how it's said, but maybe it is. And So what is the significance is of uncovering? It is? Okay, it's so so community. I'm calling – <laughs> We're gonna call the web shell fish uh, FY.sh. Like, so what's the significance of uncovering that new web shell, and how does it compare to tools like uh, China Chopper in, in terms of functionality and threat level? So we haven't been able to get a sample of it, so we can't really speak to the functionality yet. Um, basically, what that offers us is new detail about what and how Volt Typhoon is acting, because what that appears to show us is that. Um, Volt Typhoon is uh, using this particular, you know, it's a relatively small uh, piece of code, uh, you know, that, that that it puts into vulnerable software, uh, which can then allow it to, um, you know, access that software further or, you know, compromise it further, do what it wants with it, really. Uh, so the significance there is basically that, I mean, one, that specific file name hasn't appeared in previous reporting. So it seems to be mm. a new find for us. Um, but two, it's just... You know, it, it's greater granularity into what they're doing in town, and it p- offered us a pivot point to identify additional compromised infrastructure that the group seems to be using. Let's talk about some geographical targeting. So, security scorecard uh, observed possible possible targeting of the U.S., the U.K., and Australian government assets. Can you explain how we assess the the possible uh, word usage in our in our research and can you elaborate on the strategic significance of all of all of these targets uh, for Volt Typhoon? The targets would be very much in keeping with Chinese nation state cyber activity in general. Um, of course, I mean, sure, everyone spies on everyone, but right. um, given that. Uh, the rivalry between China and the U.S. has been getting more pronounced. Um, geopolitical tension does appear to be mounting, uh, and that even in times of less tension, the U.S. remained a fairly consistent target. U.S. and its allies, like the U.K. and Australia, remained a fairly right. consistent target of Chinese espionage. Um, it would make sense that uh, Volt Typhoon might be going after going after uh, the U.K., U.S., and Australian governments, just because that's almost you know who we. First, who th- who we think Chinese espionage would first be going after? And, and frankly, we have the Five Eyes intelligence sharing alliance between those three countries, Canada and New Zealand, as well. So that's the strategic context in terms of the technical details on why we think um, the activity we saw might reflect that targeting. Um, we basically, using our data, we saw the aforementioned FY.sh at a collection of IP addresses. We then looked at the IP addresses. We collected samples of traffic metadata between those IP addresses and others, which would appear to suggest, uh, you know, traffic between um, either files, either an IP, either an IP address where fi.sh had already been observed as an infection, or the IP address that was seen serving downloads about fi.sh. So either way, communication with either of those could suggest another infection down the line or membership in the same wider um, network of infrastructure, right? So we then looked at those IP addresses that had been talking to the ones we knew where we knew bad stuff was taking place. Um, 
and and are these the two the, are these the two newly identified IP addresses? Yes. So the, these uh, these are two of the newly identified IP addresses. We then looked at who that sort of second group down the line. We then looked at what their traffic metadata said and saw communication between them and a collection of IP addresses that hosted a number of .gov or .gov.uk or um, .gov.iu domains. So those communications uh, suggested uh, possible targeting of those governments. Um, now, the reason we say we kept it at possible was that those same IP addresses hosted a ton of other domains, some of which were non-government, many of which were non-government. So um, we can't say for certain that the activity was especially concerted or specifically targeting um, the particular government resources at those IP addresses. But it suggested it as a possibility if we knew that the IP addresses that had been contacting them appeared to be uh, infected or at least com also communicating with infected devices. All right. Well, this is some really, really interesting uh, research, and it brings us to a, one of the most important questions, though, is, you know, based on your findings, what immediate steps should organizations take to help mitigate the risk of Volt Typhoon and, and in particular, vulnerable Cisco devices? So it, I'm, of course, if you're using um, if you're using end, end of life devices, really, uh, anywhere, uh, even independent of the particular vulnerabilities or products we're discussing today, probably wise to upgrade. Um, so that's the first step. But, uh, you know, bearing in mind that uh, the actual, like the real high value target for Volt Typhoon are less likely to be the organizations using those end of life devices themselves, but instead organizations getting contacted by those end of life devices. Uh, I think the the real key takeaway here is is really just that um, you know ongoing ongoing vigilance and especially close attention to detail uh, is really crucial. Um, to take a step back, the one of the points that is really important that we that we missed uh, previously in this conversation is that the whole reason that um, Volt Typhoon wanted to use, wants those end of life devices in the first place. The reason it's contacting them, it, um, it's compromising them, is because uh, it can route traffic through them to get to other targets. You know, higher value targets. You know, your governments, your critical infrastructure, etc. Um, but it it's really those devices that help Volt Typhoon go undetected because what it's been doing. Um, this is like a really interesting feature of its activity. Actually, is that to remain undetected. What they do is they um, try to look local. They they try to give their um, activity the appearance of coming from the same area, like region, at least. It's like effectively like a proxy server. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. So you know, if, like let's say I operate, I don't know, some kind of, like a power plant, critical infrastructure of some sort in the U.S. I might have blocks in place that say, hey, don't let your really important assets talk to Chinese IP addresses. Like, you know, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but I might have that. But let's say that the IP address is actually, you know, a small business in the next town over. I might not have a geographic, geographically based alert to say, hey, that's suspicious traffic because it probably doesn't seem suspicious. Um, so. If that small business the next town over happens to be using a Cisco RV320, that might be Volt Typhoon's way of getting to the bigger fish down the line and looking, you know, giving off the appearance of being, you know, a small business rather than a Chinese nation state threat actor. Wow. So that, that'll bring us, I think, to our, our last question, which is uh, maybe more of a, uh, more of a, a guess based on data, and that's like considering these evolving tactics by Volt Typhoon, what future trends or escalations and activities should we anticipate or might we anticipate from such state-sponsored groups? Well, so I think in terms of escalation, the big fear is, again, the transition from espionage to more disruptive activity that, you know, as I mentioned before, that's sort of been the, the, um, 
the gui- guiding fear, let's say, of of the of Volt Typhoon's activity. Um, so that's kind of where it where we're scared that things could go if things get really bad. Um, I would say though that for um, you know for the near term barring escalation, uh, I would anticipate if not more of the same, uh, something more similar to what we've been seeing. So it might be a transition away from, you know, the particular Cisco devices or, you know, the Draytech or Netgear devices that have already been reported to other similar um, vulnerable um, Soho devices. But I think that, you know, probably much of the activity will remain the same or similar, especially because so much of it is, um, you know, characteristically, another characteristic of Volt Typhoon activity is, again, in support of this um, going undetected motive, uh, it's a lot of sort of hands-on keyboard activity. So rather than dropping malware or something detectable, it's once they're in a network, um, they're using the resources already there uh, to gather information and, you know, actually be giving human inputs to systems to extract the information they want from them rather than using malware to do it. Um, so I guess the other side of that is that maybe if there's a shift in activity to using a new strain of malware or something, we might not actually be calling it Volt Typhoon because it would no longer be matching, you know, what we take to be most characteristic of Volt Typhoon. It might be, you know, it might get a trip, even if it's the actually the same real humans down down the line, uh, just because it's different tooling or different tactics, it, you know, could be a different, we could call it a different threat actor group. Yeah. That, that, and the whole TTPs, right. They are to use someone, use someone else's TTPs or some fresh TTPs can very, it can convolute the entire attribution process of knowing who actually carried out these operations. Super interesting stuff. Um, well, I think that's that's the end here. We don't we don't want to give away the whole farm, as they say here. So, if anyone's interested in seeing the entire research report, please check it out. It's got all the bells, the whistles, the maps, uh, the charts, every visual thing you could you could ever want to help drive the this research uh, point across. So, please check it out at securityscorecard.com/slash research. And uh, great work, Rob, and thank you very much.